happy to present Ransom Stevens today. He uh, is a really diverse character. He was on the physics faculty at the University of Texas at Arlington. He was a collaborator on the team at Fermilab that discovered the top quark. He um, is national science and society correspondent at examiner.com. He's a noted public speaker. He's author of numerous technical and non-technical publications, including his novel, The God Patent, which is the first novel to advance from online ebook status to print success. The God Patent includes a major character based on the protagonist of today's talk, Emmy Noether. I'm happy to present and please welcome Ransom Stevens. As you know then, Amy Noether was a turn-of-the-century mathematician who lived in Germany. So here's our agenda. This, is, this talk is a mix of science and history. The history is biographical of Amy Noether's life. Emmy Noether led a very interesting life that was challenging, but she was a very happy person. So we will cover that. We will talk about Noether's theorem. Um, I will explain the physics behind Noether's theorem. And we'll talk a little bit about two major problems in particle physics, because they directly relate to Noether's theorem. First, the matter-antimatter asymmetry. And then second, the origin of mass problem, which translates into the search for the Higgs boson going on at Fermilab outside Chicago and at CERN, straddling the Swiss-French border. Emmy Noether was born in 1882 in Erlangen, Germany. Her father was a math professor at the university there, at the University of Erlangen. In 1900, when she was 18, Emmy got a teacher certificate. This was pretty standard fare for a, a brilliant young woman. The plan was that she was going to teach French and English and German to students, to girls, at girls' schools. But then, she decided she wanted to be a mathematician. Now this was kind of a weird development in 1900, but especially 1900 Germany, right? Because she did have this problem of being female. And so she couldn't register for classes at the university. She did have the advantage that she knew a lot of the math faculty since her father was a professor there. And so she was allowed to audit classes. She did her bachelor's degree in mathematics without ever actually enrolling in a class or taking a test. But she did take the final exam. In Europe then, and still in many cases now, it's common to have one grand exam at the end of the program upon which all things are based. And she did very well on that exam and was granted a bachelor's degree without ever actually having to pay registration. Though so I don't know that they actually paid then. Um, 
In 1904, she went ahead and applied for graduate school and ran into many of the same obstacles. But then, having performed so well on the, on the um, grand exam of the undergraduate program, she was allowed to enter the university as a graduate student. And uh, three years later, she was obtained one of the first PhDs that was granted to a woman in Germany. Well, after that, what do you do, right? What do you do with a math degree when there's no software industry to go into? You want to do more math, so you do some pure math. So she, wants, she set out for a faculty position in Germany, which was rather ridiculous at the time, of course, with that same handicap being a woman. She went to Göttingen, the University of Göttingen, which at the time was kind of the center of the mathematical universe. This was a place where all the heavyweights were working right around, right around 1907. And remember, 1907 is seven years after Planck discovered that something was funnier about light than was expected prior to that. So it was a very exciting time to be in math and mathematics and mathematical physics in particular. She took an unpaid position, and what that means basically, she was teaching some classes as a guest lecturer and studying, doing math. 